On behalf of William Mitchell College of Law and Minnesota Landmark, welcome to Lewis and Clark in court. And I'd like you to meet Alan Easley, the Dean of William Mitchell College of Law and his wife, Gwen, who are sitting right here in the front row. Yeah. And William Mitchell is our sponsor tonight. Our performance is a reenactment of a trial that was heard in December of 1953. We do this to honor Landmark's past as the federal courts building. The judge in the case was Gunnar Nordby, and the case obviously intrigued him. I'm going to quote from what he wrote after the trial. Perhaps no episode in the annals of American history has more vividly captured the imagination of the people of this nation than the Lewis and Clark expedition in the years 1804 to 1806 some 4,000 miles from the mouth of the Missouri River to the Pacific Ocean and back. And you may understand the excitement when nearly 150 years after the expedition had set forth, there was found in the attic of an old home on Farrington Avenue in St. Paul, a bundle of dust-covered papers which proved to be the original notes kept by Captain Clark at Camp Dubois before the expedition commenced as well as those made on the first leg of the journey from the mouth of the Missouri to Mandan country near Bismarck, Bismarck, North Dakota, where the expedition spent their first winter. And Judge Norby continued, and in what manner did these precious documents happen to be resting in the St. Paul home in which General Hammond, a distinguished Civil War general, had lived for many years? Though Judge Nordby was fascinated by how they came to be there, the trial is about who owned them. After the death of the general, his granddaughter turned the papers over to the Minnesota Historical Society, and they claimed ownership, asserting that his granddaughter had given the papers to them. The rest of the Hammond family claimed they belonged to all of the general's heirs, and that the granddaughter had no authority to give them to the Historical Society. The federal government claimed they belonged to them, since they were the official papers prepared by a government employee carrying out a presidential directive. These conflicting arguments brought the parties to Judge Nordby's courtroom. You will notice a side play going on, and you might be concerned that it will disturb the trial. But don't worry about that, because General Hammond, President Jefferson, and William Clark are ghosts, and only you and I can hear or see them. The St. Paul Neighborhood Network will film the performance, and since this is 2006 and not 1804 or even 1953, we ask that you turn off your cell phones, including the incoming text, te text messaging, easy for me to say, uh, <laughs> even if they do not ring the messages make bing-bing noises in the sound system. Uh, after the show, you're invited to a wine and dessert reception in courtroom 430, right upstairs. Now, let's see how Judge Nordby sorted out the ownership of what he called these precious documents. And where are our actors? <laughs> necessary items we're going to need for this evening's activity? Yes, General. I was able to get them from Captain Meriwether Lewis. Captain Lewis, did you say? Whew. Who would have thought that anyone who gives such an appearance as a stuffed shirt would be thought to keep such items? Begging the General's pardon. I believe you are greatly underestimating my former colleague. There were stories I could tell you about Captain Lewis. He would make the hair on the back of your neck stand straight up. Well, you're going to have to regale me with these tales someday. 
Oh, I bet they all relate to the stories of that grand excursion you two took. Yes, and some that happened before the journey. But general, now, the matter at hand, why have you brought us together in this place? It hardly seems appropriate for the activity that you have planned. <laughs> well, uh, Captain, uh, I have my reasons, and I'll tell you in due course. But first, we need to come here a table and some chairs here before the rest of our guests arrive. This should do pretty well here. Yeah, yeah this is about here. But, General, aren't they going to use this uh, table and these chairs for the uh, trial or whatever activity is going to be taking place here? <laughs> Don't worry about it, Captain. After all, remember... We're dead. I mean, they're not even going to notice we're here. <laughs> I suppose you're right. But, you know, I still feel awkward. As though we're, well, like we're interfering, you know? Oh, believe me when I tell you that when you find out the matter that is going to be argued here today, you will not think that we are interfering. <laughs> so, well, who is the third person that we are expecting? Well, Captain, it is your old boss. Oh, Captain Meriwether Lewis. No. The Commander-in-Chief. The President? The Right Honorable Thomas Jefferson of Virginia. <laughs> so, General, the Spence is now starting to get to me. What matter of what significance could possibly bring you, me, and President Jefferson together here? <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're right, Captain. Enough is enough. It's time to tell you the real reason that we are here. <laughs> well, Captain... This all has to do with the field notes that you wrote during your famous expedition with Meriwether Lewis. <laughs> yes, now, these documents came into my possession many, many years later, and, uh, well, they wound up in my old desk. Now, upon my death in 1890, the desk went to my daughter, Sophia. And then when she died last year in 1952, well, the desk then went to my grandchildren. Well, they started going through the desk and found all these old papers and journals and things, and, well, they really didn't have a clue as to what they'd found. Well, to make a long story short, they turned them over to the Minnesota Historical Society, and it was only then that it was realized that there, wrapped in an old newspaper among my journals, my maps, were the field notes you created during the expedition. <laughs> well, the matter leaked out to the newspapers, and well, before you know it, it was out there in the press. The field notes of William Clark are found in this old geezer's desk, <laughs> and all hell broke loose. I tell you, everybody and his brother who thought they had even a remote claim to these documents showed up. <laughs> it was a real three-ring circus. Ah, General, a three-ring circus? Oh, yes, 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 after your time. That, that's an invention of a, of a gentleman by the name of P.T. Barnum. See, he had three entirely different shows going on under this big tent called a Big Top. Oh, very exciting. I, I remember taking my grandchildren to one once. So, well, let me get this correct. They found my notes in your old desk? Now, how did you ever come in possession of my notes? Well, now, you see, Captain, I was a great admirer of you and Captain Lewis, and so over the years, they came into my possession from one source or another. <laughs> well, well, General, if they came into your possession legitimately, what's the debate about? Oh, well, now, you see, first, the Minnesota Historical Society claims that they were donated by my uh, grandchildren at the time they were turned over for identification. Well, the federal government, of course, notes that while well, you were in the military at the time of the expedition, the expedition was a formal activity of the federal government, and more importantly, the federal government paid for the expedition. So they figure any and all products that come out of that expedition must be the property of the federal government. Well, I see that point, General, but your heirs claim. Well, you don't have to be a Philadelphia lawyer to know that one now, old man. Remember, possession is nine-tenths of the law. law. Well, that's, <laughs> that's true. Captain Clark, how good to see you again. Mr. President. General Hammond. Captain Clark, I trust that General Hammond hasn't been improperly influencing you as to the proper outcome of these proceedings. Well, I must confess, Mr. President, he's brought up some valid points. Were you not on the employment of the United States government when you went on this expedition? I was, sir. And did you not understand that when you went on this expedition, the product of that expedition, the maps, the charts, the field notes, became the property of the United States government by virtue of your employment. Well, I see your point, Mr. President. But look at it this way. If I, on my own time, 
wrote down my own observations, my own recollections. Wouldn't that be my own property? My inalienable right? After all, remember, John Locke talked about life, liberty, and property. Wasn't the Revolutionary War fought over such inalienable rights? And even, oh yes, Mr. President, wasn't that included in the Declaration of Independence? I believe you might have had something to do with that. <laughs> Captain, I should think as a senior military officer, you would understand the difference between the two situations. Would your view be different if I were less senior, like maybe second lieutenant? I could understand such sentiments coming from the youthful exuberance of a more junior officer. So with the more youthful exuberance of a more junior officer, might I not expect then that this property would be mine as opposed to being a possession of the federal government? Perhaps, but were you not a captain? A second lieutenant. You were a second lieutenant? Yes, Mr. President. I appointed you as a captain. Mr. President, well, you may have intended to give me a commission as a captain for that grand expedition. The Army only commissioned me as a second lieutenant. And all the time you were gone, you were paid as a second lieutenant? That is correct, sir. My dear Clark, I must apologize. This is terrible. You know I intended that you should be a captain. I know, sir. And when you came back from your trip, I rewarded you, did I not, General Clark? <laughs> that you did, Mr. President. Well, doesn't make any difference. Money doesn't mean it to me anything to me anymore. I suppose not. Should we get to the business at hand? Yes, yes. Well, you know, Captain, I uh, believe I heard a riddle the other day. Oh? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. What is it that you call a presidential cabinet? A what, sir? <laughs> presidential cabinet. That is a group of men who individually can do nothing, but as a group decide that nothing can be done. Hey, that's a good one, General. <laughs> yes, yes. I heard, a, I heard a riddle myself. What's the difference between a general and an army mule? <laughs> Give up. <clears throat> there are no stars on the shoulders of the mule. I believe, Captain, the president has a, a little problem with political jokes. I have voted for a few political jokes in my time. <laughs> I believe General Hammond is a seasoned campaigner, and he wants to protect the honor of an army mule. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, I will admit that there is many an army mule for whom I've had much greater respect than certain uh, commanders in the field or elsewhere. I take your point. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mr. President. I appreciate that. Now, shall we oh, yes, proceed, yes, gentlemen? Yes, I believe it's up so. to you Good now. Time to all rise. All rise in the matter of Captain William Clark Field Notes recorded during the expedition of Lewis and Clark, the Honorable Gunnar H. Nordby residing. Please be seated. Who the devil are all these people, and what, what have they got anything to do with my papers? Well. They aren't your papers, for sure. That's what we're here to decide. Well, now, gentlemen, now that's my family over there. You know, they turned out to be pretty good-looking people, people there, there. Uh, except for Louie on the end. He's still kind of a funny-looking kid. And then um, we have on the far end there, the attorney is Dermot Stanley from New York City. He's representing my grandchildren. And in the middle, uh, Bergman Richards there. He's. Uh, He's representing the Historical Society. And Cliff James for the government. What? S smart young lad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, what, none, none of my relatives wanted to get involved? Apparently not, Captain. Now, more importantly, it's your bid. Oh, yes. Hereby stipulated, Your Honor, 
require that all of the evidence may be received in chambers. Questions that would elicit the content of the documents will not be asked without conference with the judge and counsel. Please proceed in accordance with your stipulation. Good God, would they get to the point on this? Patience, General. <sighs> you know, it's the trade of lawyers. They question everything, they concede nothing, and they talk endlessly. <laughs> Mr. Richards, you may go forward. <clears throat> may it please the court and gentlemen, on December 20th of 1952, Sophia Vernon Hammond Foster died at the age of 85 at the home of her sister in New York City. She was a lifelong resident of St. Paul and was one of six children of General John Henry Hammond, who died a resident of St. Paul in April of 1890. On March 19th of 1953, the St. Paul Dispatch carried a story announcing the identification of certain papers as original field notes of the Lewis and Clark expedition. These notes had been found in the attic of the Foster family home and turned over to Miss Lucille Kane of the Minnesota Historical Society for study and identification. Mrs. Foster's daughter, Mrs. Vitlacile, who had returned to St. Paul for the purpose of settling her mother's estate, had come across a dusty packet of material wrapped in an old newspaper in a desk in the attic which had once belonged to General Hammond. He was her grandfather. Your Honor, I call Miss Lucille M. Kane. Lucille Kane, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. <clears throat> Will you state your name and your occupation for the record? Miss Lucille Kane, I am curator of manuscripts at the Minnesota Historical Society. And were you the curator of manuscripts through the month of January and the following months in 1953? Yes, sir. Ms. Kane, showing you exhibit number one. I ask you to look at it and state if you know what it is. Yes, this is the checklist I prepared. Of what material? Of the Hammond papers, John Henry Hammond papers. I will show you another schedule or exhibit and ask you if you know what that is. Yes, this is the checklist of the papers of William Clark I prepared and furnished to you. Where are the papers described in these checklists at the present moment? At the Historical Society. <clears throat> and where and when did you first see them? I first saw them on January 7, 1953. Would that be at 117 Farrington Avenue in St. Paul? Yes. Mrs. Vitlisil contacted me on January 5th. I went to the home on January 7th. She conducted me to the attic, gave me a packing box, and then she showed me the papers, the location of the papers in which the Historical Society may have an interest. What was the general character or nature of the papers which you thus unpacked in the attic? Well, first I unpacked the large desk of General Hammond. And secondly, I unpacked the top of the desk. And in the third place, I unpacked some curtains. Uh, I don't remember the contents of those, however. And the general character of the papers, here's what they consisted of. Letters, letter press book, memoranda, notebooks, and the Clark notes. 
Now, of course, you did not know at that time that they were the Clark Notes. Well, no, sir. How did they present themselves to you? Visually. At that time, the papers were in a large desk. They were packed compactly but unevenly in drawers and pigeonholes. The papers in the desk top, however, were packed loosely, which is what drew my attention to a compact bundle that contained the Clark notes. In your experience as a curator of manuscripts, Ms. Kane, will you state whether you have had occasion to examine documents before 1953? Yes. I've examined over 1,500 collections, and over 300 of those I examined in attics, basements, offices, and warehouses. And would you state whether in your experience there are usually marks or indications on the papers which indicate the approximate period of time they have lain in their containers? Well, very loosely, sir, if there is a great settlement of dust, then you can tell they've been undisturbed. <laughs> what, if any, observation did you make with respect to the papers you examined in the Foster attic? Well, in general, I would conclude they'd been undisturbed for quite a while. I cannot say exactly the length of time, and I can't say all of them had been undisturbed. Now, did you eventually remove these papers from the attic? And I take it you did, because you put them in a box. Is that correct? Yes. And where did you take the box? To the Minnesota Historical Society. What happened there? Well, over a period of days, I unpacked the boxes, piece by piece. And did you eventually catalog or at least list the contents of the boxes as you unpacked them? Yes, very slowly, but eventually. The notes were located in two places in the attic. The greater part of them were wrapped in a copy of the National Intelligencer, and were found in the desk. Three pieces of notes were found in the large desk of John Henry Hammond. Have you been able to decipher the date of the issue of this national intelligencer? I believe it was 1805, but I am not sure. Now, based upon your experience in the handling of old manuscripts, have you an opinion as to whether the newspaper wrapping had been disturbed for some considerable length of time? It seemed to be undisturbed. Were there any markings of any kind on the bundle wrapped in the newspaper? No, sir. Mm -hmm. The contents of the bundle were not in any way identified? They were not. They were not identified. What did you do with the papers? I made a checklist. Uh, I noted the possible dates of the creation of each document, such as December 31, 1803, January 4, 1804, and so on. The exact date of each document would later be established by research. And by whom was the later research made? By Professor Osgood of the University of Minnesota. Tell us from your observation, Ms. Kane, whether the Clark documents all appear to be in the same handwriting. There appear to be differences in handwriting. Are you able to indicate now how many different handwritings you recognize? Oh, I, I cannot testify as an expert. I think that is all at this time, Your Honor. Mr. Stanley. Your Honor, I have no questions at this time. Mr. James. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Kane, I believe you said you were asked in a conversation by Ms. Bittnessel to attend to the late Ms. Foster's home and you went there as a result of this conversation and in fact, she was present while you were in the house, isn't that correct? Yes, sir. And did that conversation include both items of furniture that you have referred to here today? Yes, it did. Was it an open piece of furniture with a closed door? I think there was a door, but I do not recall exactly. And in this bundle of papers, which were wrapped in this national intelligencer, the newspaper that is in evidence, is that in which they were wrapped? Yes. And among these papers,
papers, were there any other papers in the container? Well, yes, a good many papers of General Hammond. And among General Hammond's papers that you found there, were there some letterpress books of General Hammond? Yes, sir. And have you studied these documents? Uh, I've read them for purposes of cataloging only. And in those documents, is there any correspondence or letterpress copies of correspondence which originated in Lawrence, Kansas? That I do not remember. From the work that you've done and your memory of it, could there have been a matter that you have seen that might have originated at Lawrence, Kansas, in the letterpress documents that you've referred to? Well, yes. My testimony does not exclude that possibility. Thank you, Ms. Kane. Thank you, Ms. Kane. You're excused. The Historical Society would like to call Professor Ernest S. Osgood as its witness. I call Professor Ernest S. Osgood. Ernest Osgood, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. You are Ernest S. Osgood, professor of history at the University of Minnesota? I am. Will you tell us in a general way what studies and research you have done in the general field of Western history of the United States? I uh, did my graduate work at the University of Wisconsin under Professor Paxson. Um, I took a PhD in history with a concentration in the history of the uh, United States West. Um, uh, following that, I came here to Minnesota uh, to teach. That was in 1927. I've been teaching here ever since, uh, supervising both graduate and undergraduate students in their researches and, of course, doing graduate research of my own in the field of uh, the history of the West, uh, Western United States. What studies and research have you done in the field of the Lewis and Clark expedition since these papers came to your attention? Well, I spent approximately three years working on these papers after Ms. Kane asked me to, to uh, uh, take charge of them, uh, organizing them, uh, indexing them, uh, uh, making a, a transcript, and uh, ultimately writing a, uh, an introduction. As a preliminary question, will you tell us in general terms what the so-called Lewis and Clark expedition was? Well, as I understand it, it was an expedition that was uh, uh, held under the auspices of the United States government, under the authority of the United States government. Uh, it was under the command of two military officers, Captain Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. And, and here I have to say that uh, Clark, although he did have a, a commission, it was not a captaincy, although uh, his friend Meriwether Lewis was pleased to call him Captain Clark. Um, the, the purpose of the expedition was to uh, proceed up the Missouri River uh, to its source, then to pass through uh, the mountain passes and uh, go down the Columbia River. And uh, upon reaching the mouth of the Columbia River uh, to return in approximately the same uh, path bringing uh, whatever uh, information that they could gather during the course of that uh, trip. And the government was delighted to pay me at the rate of a second lieutenant for that whole duration of that expedition. Yes, yes, Captain, you've made that point several times. At the time of their expedition, were Lewis and Clark officers in the regular United States Army? Well, Captain Lewis had been an officer of, since the 1790s, 
in the regular army, in the uh, infantry of the United States Army. Uh, Clark had had a commission in a uh, uh, ranger battalion uh, during the period when Anthony Wayne was, was involved in his expeditions. That was about 1791 to 1795, something like that. And shortly after that, 1796, 97, somewhere in there, Clark resigned his commission and uh, uh, then was given a commission again when he was chosen for this particular uh, uh, job. And, and as I said, however, he only got a second lieutenant's commission. He, he See, Mr. President, everybody knew but you. Yes, Clark, yes, yes, yes. I've already apologized. What more do you expect? Are we still playing poker, gentlemen? State whether the expedition by Lewis and Clark was made pursuant to an order by their superior officer. Oh, yes. Yes, it was. Sure. Pursuant to whose order was it made? The, the, the boss himself, uh, uh, the president, uh, Thomas Jefferson. Do you know whether that order of President Jefferson was authorized by an act of Congress? Well, that's a little difficult question to answer because at the time uh, that the president uh, uh, sent a message to Congress, it was a secret message uh, because at that time uh, the United States had not yet acquired uh, Louisiana from the French. So technically uh, he was contemplating going into uh, a land at, that was under the control of a foreign sovereign, but uh, uh, so Congress, he asked for money to, to support such an expedition, and, and Congress uh, did appropriate some money. I'm not a lawyer or constitutional scholar. I don't know whether that would constitute authorization or not. And Congress appropriates the money. That's authorization. That sells the issue of who owns these papers. Not necessarily so, Mr. President. As your beloved predecessor, John Adams, once said, one useless man is a disgrace, two useless men are a law firm, and three or more, well, they become a Congress. Don't quote Adams to me. I heard enough from him when I was alive. <laughs> Professor. I'm going to show you pages 247 through 252 in there, it's marked, a volume seven of Reuben Goldthwaites. Do you recognize the text on those pages as a copy of President Jefferson's orders to Lewis and Clark with regard to this expedition? Uh, yes, at page 247, uh, yes, these are, uh, this, this is a copy of Jefferson's instructions to, to Lewis, yes. We offer those pages of Thwaites and evidence under and pursuant to the stipulation which has been made between counsel. Your Honor, if I may note that that copy is a copy that belongs to the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress. That was my personal library that formed the basis for the Library of Congress. But I believe you got paid for your writings, did you not, Mr. President? <laughs> so did you, Captain Clark. But as a second lieutenant, Mr. President. <laughs> Gentlemen, are we playing poker? <laughs> Sorry, General. For the record, Professor, will you tell us the date of that order? Yes, uh, the date, uh, let's see, it's at the end here. The date is the 20th of June, 1803. Now, Professor Osgood, will you tell us how the expedition was financed? Uh, it was financed from the Treasury of the United States government. Professor, I'm going to have, hand you this, call your attention, it's marked in there, an act of Congress of February 28, 1803, two statutes at large, page 206, reading as follows. Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America, in Congress assembled, that the sum of $2,500,000 be, and the same hereby is, appropriated for the purpose of extending the external commerce 
of the United States to be paid out of any money in the Treasury not all otherwise appropriated, close quote. Will you tell us whether that appropriation so provided for was the initial appropriation in support of this Lewis and Clark expedition? That, that is my understanding, yes it was. Was the expedition, the Lewis and Clark expedition, further financed by open letters of credit issued under the authority of the United States government? Well, there you have me. I, I can't answer that question as you put it. Uh, National Archives. I, I can't say as you've asked. Just as a matter of interest, have you in your studies of the history of our country ever come across another instance of an open and unlimited letter of credit being issued to individuals? No, I have not seen that. What is there in the character of the Clark notes that makes the matter of their transcription so laborious? Well, <laughs> there are several, several problems with, with Clark's notes, let me tell you. Uh, in the first place, uh, these are not nice uh, uniform notebook pages that we're talking about here. Uh, they're pieces of various sizes. They're all the way from small pieces about the size of a postcard on up to the largest piece, uh, which is about like this, about maybe 20 by 30 inches. So they're all, all different uh, pieces that were all sort of folded up and, and rolled together and so forth. And these, uh, again, were bits of, of paper that Clark had accumulated on which he kept his notes. Uh, uh, for example, back in those days when you wanted to write a letter to somebody, you, you didn't have a, an envelope uh, such as we have today. Uh, what you would do would be to put your letter inside of another piece of paper and fold it over and then seal it with a piece of sealing wax and write your, your address on the, on the envelope. Now, Clark had received a number of these, uh, of these uh, letters over the uh, period of time, and he, he took those envelopes and kept them, used them for, uh, for this purpose. So he wrote right on those envelopes, right across the, the uh, addresses that were on them and around in the margins and so forth. And of course, some were wrinkled and some were dirty. And, so it, it, that, that was very difficult. Then he kept a record of the courses and distances that the, that the boat was traveling. Uh, he um, had to periodically cross things out and write over things and so forth. So, so that made it difficult. You must understand that he was writing under considerable pressure. Uh, the, many of these notes were made right on the, on the deck of the, of the keel boat as it was going up the river. Uh, there's, there's one point in which uh, Clark mentions that he's rewriting his notes from memory because uh, the originals had blown over the side of the, uh, of the boat. Um, uh, all of that is bad enough, but you must understand <laughs> Clark was a clumsy man. He, he, there was a point at which he spilled, no, spilled ink all over his notes. I, and not only that, he's probably the worst speller Clumsy. in the history of You of try mankind. writing with a quill pen and, as you're being fucked <laughs> about on a so boat as you're going it, down a wild raging river. It was just a... Uh, um, oh, 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 my... Oh, ma'am. Oh, oh. I'm sorry, I don't know. What's, what's the matter, Butterfingers? I can't even hang on to one sheet of paper? I don't and you're know. on dry land, Professor. I don't know what happened here. Did it get cold in here all of a sudden? I feel kind of a chill. I, I don't know. Uh, I'm sorry, Your, sorry, Your Honor. You may I don't proceed, know. Professor. I don't know what happened. It's like it had a mind of its own. You I, know, some people are meant to do things. Others just write about them. And it's your deal, Clark. I have uh, just a, 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 a one or two other things about this whole thing. Um, uh, there, there's a point where you can get a complete set of Clark's fingerprints off of these, off of these notes. He, he handled them so roughly. Finally, uh, to top it all off, he wrote with a quill pen. 
And if you know anything about quill pens, you know that they wear and, and the writing deteriorates pretty rapidly. Uh, I, I could show you some places in the original notes in which, in which uh, obviously he sharpened the quill or took a new one because uh, then the writing would improve substantially and it would be much easier and then would deteriorate again and become more difficult to read. All of that made it very, very difficult to, to, to read his, his notes. To what extent are you familiar with the handwriting of Captains Lewis and Clark? Well, I had seen Clark's handwriting in, in the Indian uh, Bureau papers uh, some years ago in Washington. Uh, I was quite familiar with it at that time, and when I saw these notes, uh, when, when Ms. Kane asked me to look at these, I uh, immediately could tell both from the internal evidence and from the uh, handwriting that this had to be Clark's uh, handwriting, this had, these had to be Clark's notes. Now, uh, I should say there were one or two places where uh, the entries were made by Captain Lewis rather than Captain Clark, but um, did that while Clark was out hunting or something, I guess. Damn right. You know, someone had to hunt and provide food for the expedition. You know, Lewis, scientist that he was, you know, he couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. Yeah. I guess that's all, Your Honor. Mr. James. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Osgood, going back to when you first <coughs> took the witness stand, I understood you to say that you've been engaged in the teaching profession of graduate and undergrad students, uh, undergraduate students, uh, at the University of Minnesota for some 35 years. In fact, I was a student of yours uh, some time back, was I not? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, uh, James, you were, yes, you were a student, uh, not a very good one. Uh, yes, uh, that, I would guess that was about 1935, am I, am I right on that? You're partially correct, Professor. Very good. As a historian, have you heard anything in regard to these Lewis and Clark papers being at the Kansas Historical Society? Well, I have seen the, uh, the uh, uh, guide that the Kansas Historical Society publishes. Uh, it doesn't refer to Lewis and Clark papers, but it does show that there are papers uh, uh, generated uh, while Clark was involved in as a, a, a superintendent of what they called the Western Superintendency of the Indian Bureau. Which at what time was located in Lawrence, Kansas, isn't that right? Well, you see, when Clark was the director, he, he continued, let's see, he didn't give it up until he died, which uh, I guess he had no choice at that point. He, <laughs> he, uh, uh, but, but that was in St. Louis at that time. Professor, the superintendency was at one time located at Lawrence, Kansas. Was oh, yeah, back one time. It was in several different places over the years. It moved several times. Professor, then I will ask you now, if you know of any papers other than those in evidence here today that are located not in an institution that makes them available to the public and to scholars in a manner that is commensurate with the additional function that they perform of preserving the papers from destruction. Do I know of papers that are not in? If I understand your question correctly, no, I do not know of any papers like that. So that, at the time these papers were found in the attic, as you have testified here to today, they were the only original papers of the Lewis and Clark expedition, not in public hands, but in private hands. Isn't that correct? To the best of my knowledge, that is correct, yes. Do you have an opinion, Professor, whether this expedition was one of exploration, discovery, or for military purposes? Well, it, it had elements of all three. Uh, if, you, if you look at Jefferson's instructions, uh, you can see he was concerned with the collection of information and the examination of the terrain and so forth, and also very much concerned with military defense of this area. Dr. Osgood, do you know what Captain Lewis's employment was prior to leaving on the expedition? Yes, he was the secretary to President Jefferson. 
Had he also been an officer in the United States Army? Yes, yes. He, he was an officer, as I mentioned before, I think since, since the 1790s. So he had been secretary in the office of the president while he was an officer in the United States Army under a commission as captain, which he received in 1802. That is correct. He was a military officer who was assigned to the office of the president. Yes. And then how about after his return from the expedition? Well, when Lewis and Clark uh, came back, uh, this was in September of 1806, they came back to St. Louis, uh, they immediately began work on preparing their journals for publication. They um, uh, worked at that for a while and then went to Washington later in the fall. They, uh, we, we don't have any evidence about this, but the assumption is that they discussed uh, potential publication with, with President Jefferson. Um, by the spring of the following year, it would be 1807, they were back in St. Louis. Both of them had uh, jobs, had assignments back in St. Louis. What were those positions? Uh, Captain Lewis was governor of the entire territory. Uh, Clark was uh, in charge of Indian affairs and of military matters. Uh, it's not clear the extent to which they did further work on the publication of the papers at that time. Professor Osgood, it is the conclusion, is it not, of historians that for some years thereafter, the papers that were gathered as part of the expedition were believed to be all of the existing original documents of the Lewis and Clark expedition of any moment or importance, and if there had been any others, they would just be minor. Yes, I don't know of any historian who, uh, who uh, said anything to the contrary. Um, it was not until the 1890s or even the early 1900s when some uh, documents began to show up in private hands that, that related to the expedition. I have no further questions for Professor Oscar. Mr. Richards. Your Honor, I rest. Thank you, Professor Osgood. You may step down. Mr. Jaynes, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the government waives its opening statement and wishes to call its first witness at this time, Dr. Robert H. Obama. Robert Balmer, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. <clears throat> Will you please state and spell uh, state your name for the record and your place of residence? Dr. Robert H. Balmer, and I live in Chevy Chase, Maryland, which is a suburb of Washington, D.C. Dr. Balmer, what is your occupation? I am Assistant Archivist of the United States. In general terms, what are the duties of the Assistant Archivist of the United States? Essentially to preserve and make available for public use the permanently valuable uh, records and documents of the federal government. In your capacity as the Archivist of the United States, what has been your education? I have a doctoral degree from the University of Minnesota in history, and I've also attended the universities of Colorado and California. In fact, weren't you a student of Professor Osgood, who has testified here today? Yes, as a matter of fact, I was. You were also present at Dr. Osgood's testimony and throughout this trial, have not? Yes, I was. Dr. Baumer, do you know whether the records of the superintendency, first known as the St. Louis Superintendency, then later known as the Central Superintendency, remained with that superintendency until it was closed in 1877? I cannot answer whether the records were there at the time General Hammond closed the superintendency. Um, when he closed it, as is typical, he would get instructions from Washington, D.C., and he did get instructions to send the records that he reported were there at the time back to Washington. Um, the latter part of that period would include a portion of General Clark's superintendency and then a part for the next period. Uh, whether they were there at that time, there's simply no record. 
Then I will ask you, Dr. Palmer, did General Hammond perform any service, as far as you know, in Indian Affairs? Yes, General Hammond was commissioned as Superintendent of Indian Affairs of the Dakota Superintendency. As a historian and an archivist, can you tell the court, please, who General Hammond was? Give a brief biographical sketch, if you will. Yes, I've done some research on General Hammond in the past. He was born in 1833 in New York City. Um, he studied engineering at Cincinnati. He worked in a mercantile shop in New York, and he was in Clinton, Iowa from 1854 to about 1857 engaged in railroad work. General Hammond had an active Civil War career. Um, he was he gained uh, the attention of Sherman and was actually appointed as the assistant adjutant general uh, for General Sherman. He was commended by uh, General Grant to President Lincoln, and according to a document that Ms. Kane unearthed, of which I haven't seen the original, but from which I took a statement, he was one of the most industrious, indefatigable, and bravest men I've ever seen in action. Now, now that was Grant's comment on him in a letter um, that recommended him for uh, the position of Brigadier General. Um, after the war, General Hammond was president of several small railroads, including the St. Louis Council Bluffs and Omaha Railroad. Uh, he was in the banking business in Chicago from about 1871, and he suffered rather severely during the Panic of 1873. Yeah, knocked me out flat, did, well, like everybody else at the time. <laughs> After that, he appeared to have been in various businesses um, until he was appointed to the Indian service in 1877. After he was out of the Indian service, he moved to the city of St. Paul and lived there until his death in 1890. Now, did you just say General Hammond was appointed to the superintendent of the Office of Indian Affairs in 1877? Yes, I have the document of his appointment right here. Also from the commissioner's letter of the Indian office containing a record of the telegram sent in January of 1878 to Nicholson, who was the outgoing uh, superintendent, and to Hammond, who was taking over. Um, the one to Nicholson reads, you are requested to deliver uh, to Superintendent Hammond the records, files, and papers belonging to the central superintendency and take his receipt for the same in bulk. And then, of course, the, the letter or the telegram to General Hammond from Lawrence, Kansas, um, states, likewise, received from Dr. Nicholson all of the records, files, and papers of the Lawrence affairs in bulk and receipt for them in the same way. Do you know where the records of that superintendency were maintained during that period of time from the time Captain Clark took over until the time General Hammond was sent this telegram that you've just referred to? Well, from both external and internal evidence, the internal evidence being the records of the superintendency themselves, for which we have the dates and places and addresses of outgoing letters to that superintendency. Uh, it was at St. Louis, Missouri, at St. Joe, at Atkinson, Kansas, and at Lawrence, Kansas at different times. It, uh, it moved several times. Now the next letter uh, from Hammond from Lawrence, Kansas, states, uh, dated February 11th, 1878, it says, I have the honor to state that I have this day shipped per American Express Company uh, one typewriter, eight cases containing books and records and papers accumulated at St. Louis and Atkinson with the central superintendency, and so forth and so forth. This is a very long document, some 30 pages or so. Um, it lists the contents of those files, and over at the left side, it places the approximate dates of those files uh, in the boxes. Now, there are a few that do go back to the Clark period, and there's a notice in one bundle of uh, ancient maps and on one bundle of old bills and papers from Clark, uh, those dates being 1833 to, uh, excuse me, 1830 to 1833 uh, for both of those files. Now, those records um, were sent, according to our records, to Washington, D.C., and we now have those in the National Archives with the Indian records. Thank you, Dr. Bomber. Your Honor, no further questions. Mr. Stanley.
Now, you just gave us an outline of General Hammond and his career at various places, but you omitted to state that he at one time lived in Louisville. Is that not the case? I don't know he lived there. Um, he was there towards the end of the Civil War. I believe he was a commander of a hospital or a camp or something of that nature. He was there for several months, maybe a year. Um, I haven't been asked to do a detailed study of the general's career. Do you know that when uh, General Clark's family was in Louisville, that members of General Hammond's family were there also? The end of the Civil War? No. No more questions, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jaynes. Your Honor, the government rests. Rest? You're not even going to redirect on this witness? <laughs> Mr. President, please let him handle the trial. After all, he is the living lawyer. And the bid is 10 to the president here. You know, it goes to show the lawyer is about the only person in a courtroom who doesn't suffer for his own ignorance. What do you have? What do you have? Give me your cards. I have a pair of kings. You. Two pair. Fives and deuces. Well, I have you beat. Aces and eights. Two pairs. Oh, how appropriate. Uh, the dead man's hand. Dead man's hand? Yeah. What, oh, is, that's, what does that mean? Oh. I think that must have come after us. <laughs> yes, yes. That would be after your time. That's more from my era. See, this actually refers to a, a rather colorful character, a, a lawman by the name of James Butler Hickok. <laughs> well, now, you see, when he was shot to death, he was playing poker, and he was holding a pair of aces and a pair of eights, now forever known as the dead man's hand. <laughs> Dr. Bomber, thank you. You are excused. Mr. Stanley, you may proceed. Storm to the stand. Colton Storm, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Mr. Storm, uh, what is your professional background? I am the executive director of the Western Reserve Historical Society. And what has been your professional history prior to becoming director of the Western Reserve Historical Society? Well, I graduated from Oberlin College with a bachelor's degree. I moved to Chicago where I opened an antiquarian bookstore. I operated that bookstore in Chicago for several years, and then I moved to New York, where I joined the Anderson Gallery Auction House, and I served there as an evaluator and cataloger of manuscripts and rare books. Then an associate and I opened another antiquarian bookstore in New York, and we operated that through the end of the 30s, and in 1942, I moved from there to the Clements Library, which you may know is one of the premier libraries with the collection of Americana. And I served as a manuscript curator there and evaluator of materials until 1954, when I became the executive director of the Western Reserve Historical Society. During the approximately eight years that you were in New York, you were engaged largely in dealing with rare, rare manuscripts, were you not? I was indeed, sir. Could you approximate the number of items? Well, it's hard for me to tell you the exact number of items, but if we think about the sort of items that are in discussion here, manuscripts that were prepared by individuals in the government service of one sort or another, I would say several thousand. And these all related to government matters? Yes, they were the, uh, prepared by people who were in government service and at one form or another. Uh, and then uh, passed into private hands. In connection with your duties at Anderson Galleries, did you prepare catalogs or help prepare catalogs? I did. One that comes to mind is the 
Reed sale, which contained papers of General Nathaniel Green, who was a general in the Continental Army, and those papers related to his service in the Army. And then in that same sale, there were papers of General Johnson around his surrender terms to some other general. But you know, there were dozens and dozens of generals in the Civil War, and I can't remember that fellow's name. Are there any papers of Josiah Horner? Oh, Josiah Horner's papers are in the Clements Library, and he was a very interesting young man. He served with Nathaniel Green and George Washington during the Revolution, uh, was assigned to carry the treaty ratifying the peace at the end of the Revolution to Benjamin Franklin in Paris, and then afterwards, when he returned, uh, was offered the command of the U.S. Army. Now, regarding the Clinton Haskell collection in the Clements Library, will you describe that collection? Oh, that's a very extensive collection of materials related to the same sort of uh, things that we're talking about here, papers of General Washington and his family, letters and documents. There are papers from General Sherman relating to the Civil War and also the Western military posts after the Civil War and a third set of about 230 documents produced by various other generals during the Civil War. Now, isn't it, is it true that during the period 1800 to 1830, approximately, most government officials on leaving the employment of the government took their personal and private papers and government papers home with them? That's true. Uh, from George Washington all the way down to Thomas Jefferson, there was a strategy where uh, people would take their papers. The primary rationale for that is that the president not only was the chief executive of the government, but also the head of the political party, and as such would have papers that would be his. And in addition, people he appointed, cabinet officials and other executives, would be his political advisors. They would also have the same power to take papers that they prepared during the, their work in the government that they did not think were necessary. Mr. Jaynes. Uh, your Honor, no questions for this witness. No cross, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Storm. You are excused. Louis Starr, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. For the record, would you state your name and residence? Louis Starr, and I live in Parr Hills, New Jersey. You are the grandson of General Hammond, are you not? I am. And are you familiar with his life, his history, and his family? I am. Where was your grandfather married? He was married in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And to whom was he married? My grandfather married Sophia Vernon Wolf in November of 1864. And had your grandmother's family lived in Louisville, Kentucky for some time? They had. And is it a matter of family knowledge that they were friends of the family of General Clark? I have heard that. Your Honor, may it please the court, I object. There's been no proper foundation laid. This is uh, too general. I think you need further foundation, counsel. Did your grandfather live in Louisville for any length of time? He was there frequently and did live in Louisville. How long, approximately? <laughs> oh, it was for an extended period, uh, several years anyway. And do you know what his occupation was for the next several years after he was married? Yes, he served in the Union forces with General Sherman. How long did he remain in the Union forces? Until the end of the war. No more questions, Your Honor. <coughs> that, that's one smart attorney now. Now, who would have thought it was vaguely possible that I might have gotten those documents from my wife's family? <laughs> you know, the grandson turned out pretty good, too, even if he did get stuck with my nose. But, you know, there's some hope for the future yet. 
There's no better way to exercise the imagination than the study of law. No artist has ever interpreted nature more freely than a lawyer interprets the truth. Now, I agree that's true, Mr. President, but as your contemporary and fellow idealist Jeremy Bethan once said, lawyers sometimes tell the truth. They'll do anything to win a case. <laughs> Mr. Starr, after the war, where did General Hammond go? Well, apparently he went to Chillicothe, Missouri, where he became president of a railroad. He organized the Omaha Council Bluffs and St. Louis Railway, which later became the Wabash, St. Louis, and Pacific. And then he eventually moved the family to Chicago, Illinois in 1871. And where did he go from Chicago? Well, during the Civil War, he had contracted a fever, so he was required to work in the Northwest. So he traveled in and through the Northwest Territories and eventually moved to Evanston, Illinois, where he became connected with the Indian Affairs in 1876. Now, do you know where he lived after he left the Indian Affairs? Yes, St. Paul, Minnesota. And I believe he lived there until his death in 1890, isn't that right? But for some occasional visits to Superior, Wisconsin, St. Paul was the family home. Thank you, Mr. Starr. Your Honor, no further questions. No questions, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Mr. Starr. Mr. Stanley. Have a family the rest of the Thank case. you, Mr. Starr. You're excused, sir. Gentlemen, it, time has come for closing statements. Mr. Richards, please proceed on behalf of the Historical Society. Your Honor, the position of the Historical Society is simple. It is not concerned with the minutia of the chain of ownership of these papers. But as stewards of our vital history and with a duty to maintain this for generations, the Historical Society believes that these documents should be preserved and be available to the public for viewing. These notes reference in themselves an actual part of the record of an event that was part of one of the most significant events of our nation's history to lock them up so that future generations cannot witness for themselves the actual records of these great men would be a great injustice. And be a great injustice to this assembled body and to the nation as a whole. Thank you, Mr. Richards. Mr. Jaynes, on behalf of the United States government. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, the evidence has clearly established that upon his return from the expedition, Captain Clark was promoted to Brigadier General. He was eventually stationed at the St. Louis Superintendency, which became the Central Superintendency. In 1877, General Hammond was appointed to the same post as General Clark and remained there until its closing. General Hammond's final job was to close it down and to forward any and all records to Washington, D.C. Testimony has clearly shown that those records would have included documents from the time when General Clark was stationed there. As the assistant archivist, Dr. Romer, stated moments ago, those are the exact type of documents that are normally kept by the government in the archives because they belong to the people of the United States. On behalf of the United States government, I respectfully request that this court return those documents to the people of the United States of America. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. James. Mr. Stanley, on behalf of the Hammond family.
Your Honor, the government has not met its burden of proof. First, it has failed to establish the documents or even part of the documents that were at the St. Louis Superintendency when General Hammond closed it. Second, the testimony clearly established, establishes that the documents that were prepared when individuals were employed by the United States government have in fact been bought and sold as a commodity on the open market. And finally, you have heard testimony from General Hammond's grandson that his family had an acquaintance with the family of General Clark long before General Hammond assumed a position at the St. Louis Superintendency. General Hammond could have therefore come into possession of these documents through his family rather than military service. The government has not established that General Hammond obtained these documents through discharge of his duties as an agent of the United States government, and I respectfully request that this court rule in the favor of the Hammond family and return the property to them. Thank you, Mr. Stanley. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a most interesting case to hear. While my formal written opinion will not be published for some time, I am prepared to give my oral opinion at this time. The government has the burden of proving its case, and in its brief it makes two essential points. The first is that General Hammond had these papers in his possession unauthorized and illegally. The second point is that even if he had them in his possession properly and in accordance with law, they were the property of the United States government because they were made in the course of a military expedition funded by the United States Congress at the request of the U.S. President and contained information that was the very essence of this expedition. Now, the Hammond's brief goes on beyond mere summation. The Hammond's have done a very thorough and intensive job in researching the information collected on this expedition, and the Hammond's have proven that the notes made by General Clark after the expedition left the staging base on the Dubois River contained information that was duplicated almost fact for fact in the final journals of this expedition turned over to the Congress and the President upon completion of the expedition. The Hammond's go on to argue that these papers must be judged by the standard of the day that they were prepared, that is in the early 1800s, not by today's standards where they would be valuable for historical research or in, of inestimable value as collector's items. In 1806, the Hammond's argue, these papers were of no value because they were, contained the same information that was in the final journals of the expedition. Now, certainly every inference to be drawn from the testimony in this case leads to the conclusion that Captain Clark believed these papers were his own personal property. And certainly the, the papers that were prepared prior to the time that the expedition left the Dubois River staging basin, these were nothing but notes of his conversations with Lewis and general discussions about matters that went on of an ordinary day-to-day -day type of conversation. The government was not interested in these notes at that time. It is the Hammond's argument that these must be measured by the standard of the day that they created, and that argument is the theory that I adopt in deciding this case. Now, it is certainly tenable that the, government, uh, the government's argument that the, these papers came into the possession of Captain Clark 
uh, or General Hammond, excuse me, uh, in an unauthorized way. But the evidence is so sketchy and so te uh, untenable that I cannot base findings of fact based upon this evidence. And therefore, in conclusion, it is my opinion that the government has failed to sustain its burden of proof and that my order must be entered in favor of the Hammonds. I wish you all a very ha Merry Christmas and a very Happy New Year. Well, too bad, Mr. President. Looks like you lose this one. Voltaire said, I've never been ruined but twice in my life. Once when I lost a lawsuit, and another time when I won. <laughs> that this building has a resident ghost, but I don't think that it has ever seen such three such unruly ones <laughs> as they have here tonight. Uh, the government appealed Judge Nordby's decision, uh, but the Court of Appeals agreed with the District Court. And today those notes are in the Beneke Library at Yale University. Uh, Frederick Beneke, a private collector from New York, purchased the notes from grandson Louis Starr and donated them to Yale and today you can view them online if you would like to do that. Uh, is Amy here? I want to introduce the executive director, there she is, of Landmark, Minnesota Landmark. I don't think I even said her last name, Amy Mino. Um, join us in courtroom 430 to enjoy some wine and some dessert and to meet the cast and if you're real lucky to get an autograph or two. <laughs> uh, and another bow. And thank you for coming.